So welcome. On behalf of the Diocese of Maine, I'm Philip Hamilton. I'm a parishioner at St. Albans Parish. And I've been working with the Transition Committee. And so here today, we have this great opportunity to meet our five nominees to be our new bishop. So before we get started, I want to just say a few words about how we came to be here at this time. As you know, in July of 2017, Bishop Lane announced that he would be retiring. Uh, and at that time, he called for the election of a new diocesan bishop. In the latter few months of 2017, the Standing Committee worked and uh, started rolling in the process. And they uh, assembled uh, two teams, two committees to help them uh, from mem people from around the diocese, a discernment committee and a transition committee. The discernment committee went off and did the hard work of trying to understand what the attributes and characteristics of the diocese are, and then what sort of person would be best to come and serve, walk with us over these next few years. Um, in October of this year, they met in retreat and uh, announced a, a set of five nominees. And we have them today. We're going to see those nominees today. And we've been through this process of walkabout process. And now what happens from here? We'll, we'll have a chance to, to meet people today. And then as we go forward, on February 9th, uh, some of you, I'm sure, will be gathered in Bangor to, be electing, to join and work in the electing convention. After the electing convention in May of this year, we'll have two opportunities to say goodbye to Bishop Lane. There'll be an event in Bangor, an event here in Portland. And then on June 22nd, we'll have an ordination and consecration of our new bishop. And we're very pleased that the uh, Reverend Curry, the presiding bishop, is going to come and uh, be here for that ordination and consecration. Uh, bishop Lane called for the election of a diocesan bishop, not a bishop coadjutor. So Bishop Lane and Gretchen are planning to move back to the Rochester, New York area where they have family. And so they will be leaving Maine in June. And our new bishop consecrated on the 22nd will then become our diocesan bishop. So a note about today. Uh, each of our candidates is going to have a few minutes to uh, come and, and, and tell us about where they are and, and where we're going forward. And then we'll have a chance to ask some questions. Um, it, we will have five, all five will be here. Um, we'll be about 30 minutes with each candidate. If you need to use the facilities out that door, uh, the restrooms are quite well marked around there. Please, if you need to go, go. Um, between our second and third candidate, we'll have a little bit longer break to, to stretch, uh, but we're going to try to drive through for the rest of the afternoon. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Janet Wagner, who will be our first nominee. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. I would like, as I begin, to introduce to you my husband, Dr. Ed Wagner. <laughs> he is a theology professor at Bright Divinity School, which is a Disciples of Christ-based divinity school in Fort Worth, Texas. His job was actually what took us to Texas. We are, I, we are natives of the Pacific Northwest. I grew up in the mountains of Washington State and then lived for 12 years in Salem, Oregon, before moving with my husband to uh, Connecticut, where we lived for 15 years. So in answer to the question, do we like the snow, the answer is yes. <laughs> I want to tell you a few things about myself that you will not find in the profile material or on the other videotapes. One of the things that grounds me in this life is understanding family history and genealogy. All of my, you, you couldn't tell this from the color of my skin, but all of my ancestors are European. <laughs> Um, and my father's family are English and Scottish primarily, and they came uh, to this country in the late 1700s and 1800s, 
and wound their way across the United States and homesteaded in the hills above the Columbia River in Washington State. In high desert country, they had the audacity to believe that they could grow watermelons. And they did. They grew them and sold them in Washington State. Another thing that really helps me to be oriented to the world is photography. And I, one of the things I love about photography is the act of framing something, looking for the context in which something sits, looking for the best light, the best angle, to make whatever it is show up in its full measure of beauty. Last but not least, I will just tell you about myself that I am a longtime member of the Society of the Companions of the Holy Cross. I actually began being a companion in uh, Washington State, and then as we moved across the country, um, got in touch with the New Haven chapter of the Companions. And for over 20 years, I have annually visited Adeline Rood in Byfield, Massachusetts. I would like to tell you a little bit about what it is that I do now as canon to the ordinary in the Diocese of Fort Worth. You have a canon to the ordinary here in the Diocese of Maine, Michael Ambler. What you may not know is that that title, canon to the ordinary, is not, does not have a universal meaning. So that job, working for the bishop, has a very different job description in different places. My job as canon to the ordinary is somewhat unique because I, I serve for and with a provisional bishop. Bishop Scott Mayer, who is the bishop diocesan of the diocese next door, the Diocese of Northwest Texas, and about three years ago he also became our provisional bishop. What that means is that he is in our diocese about one-third time on the ground and in his other diocese about two-thirds time. What that looks like is that he's in the Diocese of Fort Worth three to four days a month. And <laughs> I serve with him as his partner as the chief of staff of the diocese. I um, am, am, like Michael Ambler, the transition ministry officer, which means I help congregations find clergy and clergy find congregations. I do more uh, pastoral care uh, on behalf of the bishop than most canons would do. I am also the congregational development officer, <laughs> and I work with congregations directly, particularly in, in times of conflict or particular need. This role has very well prepared me, I think, to serve as your next bishop, which I would very much love to do. The skills that I have been learning in the Diocese of Fort Worth are burning a hole in my pocket, as it were. <laughs> and, um, and I would love to bring them here, in part because one of the things that I saw and heard in your profile is that you are ready. You are ready to make some changes in some places. In other places, you know some changes are going to have to be made. And I believe that you would be well served by a bishop that is ready to hit the ground running and to not delay in taking this opportunity for change with you, boldly and soon. <laughs> One other thing I would, I would just love to say is um, I, I look at leadership in many ways like, like the Patriots and Tom Brady, who is playing later this afternoon. <laughs> uh, about two weeks ago, Tom Brady posted something on his Instagram feed that has really stuck with me. Uh, he posted a quote by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who is, as many of you may know, a Hall of Fame basketball player. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar once said, through basketball, I found my superpower. My power wasn't in being a great player, 
but in loving something enough to work hard at being better. As a priest, as a canon, possibly as your bishop, I love the church and am glad to be a part of being of working together to make us better. Thank you, Janet. Uh, the first question that I would like to ask is in uh, 2018, the General Convention, after much prayer, has affirmed the Episcopal Church's commitment to marriage equality. Yes. What opportunities have you taken to personally affirm this historic, uh, personally affirm this historic reform? What opportunities have you taken to personally affirm this yes. historic reform? reform. As you may well be aware, um, Fort Worth and Texas, well, Fort Worth is actually the only major metropolitan area that went red in the last general election in this country. It's a pretty conservative place. In the midst of that, the Episcopal Church has carved out a niche of being more liberal and openly so. In that place, where there are many people who are longing for the loving, liberating, life-giving word of God and presence of Jesus. So we are proud in that context to be able to offer opportunity for folks who are gay and lesbian to be married. And we do that publicly. You can look at that on our website, and we talk a lot about how to not only do that, but also to honor those who don't see that as a reform, but are, who are really opposed to that. It is difficult in our polarized and increasingly polarized country to be people of the middle way and to help people understand that fully embracing and putting forward something new, something we're called to do, does not mean we are rejecting other people and their perspectives. Thank you. Oh, you asked me, though, what have we done? Uh, I, I think the, question, the questioner was really um, asking about what opportunities have you personally taken to affirm? OK. So yes, yes. corporately. Corporately. Personally, um, the, the lead thing that I do is I have conversations with our clergy uh, and their congregations about how we are going to implement that. Um, and we have a policy in the Diocese of Fort Worth that if a clergy person is going to do that in a congregation, that the congregation has to be in step with that. And so we talk to them about what that means and how to move forward in that. Thank you. Uh, just Curious, have you done any uh, same gender I have weddings? not done any same gender blessings. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a number of questions that relates to uh, the role of the church in the world. Okay. And um, they really get down to justice and how the bishop might work in matters of public policy and public uh, taxation. Um, so I think that's really where it goes to. Why don't you, how do you envision the role of the Episcopal Bishop of Maine in relation to issues of social justice and political policy? That's really the crux of these the questions. The crux of the matter. There are two questions that have been coming up in every context that we've been talking in. One is about the role of the deacons, and the other is this issue about social justice, and the, particularly about the role of the bishop in that. We've had a lot of practice in the Diocese of Fort Worth. I have had a lot of practice in helping the Diocese of Fort Worth hone its message on things like gun control in Texas. <laughs> and we, we must, as I was saying before, make sure that people know that they're included in the conversation, whether or not they agree. I see the bishop and the canon as people who are to be uh, pushing forward avidly and in action-oriented ways, 
particularly around things that are about the gospel. And in any justice or advocacy work that we do, I think we are far better as Christians if we ground ourselves in an understanding theologically and biblically of why it is we're doing what we're doing. And then from that position, we can go forth boldly and have conversations and take stands on a variety of things from uh, helping the homeless and partnering with them where they are living and gun control and women's issues, education, all of those things. Thank you. I have two questions here which are kind of the two sides of the same coin. Okay. So the first is, how do you envision the role of the cathedral, a vibrant and thriving place? And then the second side is, uh, what will you do to support small and struggling parishes and how they provide social services in their community? I think that's interesting because the cathedral also provides social services in their community. So both sides, how do you? How do I envision that? As your bishop, I would be the new kid on the block. So the first thing I would do is try to learn what is going on in your ministries, in your congregations. We were, we were invited as nominees for bishop by Ben and the, con the congregation of the cathedral to come and see. What a gift and what a place to start that dialogue is to be invited. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, it looks to me like the cathedral is active and doing many things well, from worship to social services. As bishop, I would want to partner with you in that. And um, I, I understand that the bishop and his wife have been worshiping there. It's their home church. And I can see that working out very well for my family. Um, I'm on the road quite a bit now as canon. I would continue to be on the road quite a bit as bishop. And so my husband and kids very much need a church home. We found that in Fort Worth. We would need to find that here. Um, Something that the cathedral does have in common with a lot of the small congregations that I've heard about in Maine is local work of social justice, which looks very different in different contexts. I think we have a lot to learn from each other. As bishop, the question I would ask is the same question I ask as canon. Where are you seeing the light and love of God here, and how are you sharing it? And what can the diocese do, what can I do as your bishop to help support that effort? In some cases, what folks want is for us to do a video uh, or help with a newspaper article in their context. Some congregations ask us to pray particularly for something that's going on. Some congregations ask us to help them get started with something, either by effort or by money. Um, we have done all of those things, and gladly so. The next, again, two questions, similar topics. Um, given that the average age of parishioners has... I'm going to read both of them and then okay. address. Given that the average age of parishioners has been steadily increasing without an influx of younger members, what do you plan to do to create an appealing environment for young people in which they would feel welcomed and accepted by the church, specifically young adults and teens? Okay. okay. Asked a different way, how does the Episcopal Church share its message with millennials and Gen Xers who do not attend church and are often antagonistic about the church? Our call as clergy and as Christians comes from the Apostle Paul in this form. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within you. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within you. I believe that the secret 
the secret sauce <laughs> in connecting with people of all ages is to be able to articulate what the love of God has done for us and what we see the Holy Spirit doing in our communities and then bravely inviting people to come and see, as Jesus did. I worshipped very early this morning at the cathedral at 7.30, and um, the Reverend Eleanor was giving a sermon, and she asked very specifically for people to think about giving a reason for the hope that is within them in secular language. And we forget sometimes that as Christians, we are intended to learn the language of those folks in our neighborhoods, whether they are like us, whether they are not like us, whether they literally speak the language we do or not, whether they are older than us, whether they are younger than us. We are called upon to be the bridge, to learn the language of the people that are around us. That may mean learning Spanish or French, literally, but it always means listening until we hear resonance between the love we have experienced and the life experience of those around us, and then articulating that bridge. When we do that, as we do that, then I think people will be able to learn something from our tradition that we love so much, a tradition which has so much to offer. One of the ways that I as canon and I, I do and I as bishop would uh, promote connection with millennials and young, people younger than that, children and teens, is to be present with our congregations in contexts where they are. I think the bishop has to lead from the front sometimes, and that means being willing to go wherever it is that we need to go to be with people. And if, if the teens and the millennials aren't in our churches, well, where are they? How do we go to them? And I would gladly spend time with our congregations in your communities. Again, two similar questions. Um, could you share information about your spiritual life of prayer and perhaps give an example of being moved by wisdom greater than your own? And then a little bit different, but from that, what gifts in particular do you have to bring to this diocese? couple things I want to say about my spiritual life. The first is, I learned how to pray in a church of the Nazarene, the church of my parents, in Goldendale, Washington. We went to church three times a week, which didn't make us holier, but I think it did give us more opportunity to learn from one another how to pray. And one of my favorite memories from being in that church were the Wednesday nights, every Wednesday night, when I went with my mother. And after introductions and a couple of hymns and a couple of corporate prayers, people would bear witness to what God was doing in their lives. And then we would all turn around in our pews and kneel on the floor with our elbows on the seats, and we would pray. I learned from the saints how to pray as an act of speaking to God in real world terms. God, I really don't know what you're up to. God, we really need more help here. God, thank you. So my prayer life has been profoundly shaped by that experience and by centering prayer. I find the silence in centering prayer to make space in me for things I cannot articulate and things I otherwise would not hear. So that's a little 
piece of my spiritual life. I'm also greatly nourished by the words of scripture and hymnody. When I'm really, really stuck, picking up a hymnal and looking at the words of some of our traditional hymns, you know, people put a lot of thought into those, (laughs) really often helps me hear something that is new or just shaped differently enough that I can pick up on it, um, and that nourishes my soul. I can't remember the second part of the question. (laughs) It was, um, what particular gifts do you have to offer to this diocese? Um, First of all, that, (laughs) what I just said. I really believe that all we do as Christians is steeped in who we are as beloved children of God. And so any and all ministry that I am blessed to be a part of rises from that. As I shared with you a minute ago, I think I have some pretty practical gifts and skills in everything from conflict resolution to Title IV, uh, dealing with Title IV disciplinary issues with clergy and congregations. Um, I can not only read a budget, I can stick to one. (laughs) <laughs> with an organization, um, and, and practically speaking, uh, have the skills to walk with your congregation through things like, say, a building program. So all of those practical skills, though, um, are secondary, I think, to, um, I, I think the most important thing my experience as a clergy person has done for me has is it's taught me that there are so very many things I don't know. It's taught me that you in your congregations know the most about your contexts. Often things you may not even know you know. And so part of my role as a leader of the diocese is to come in and have conversations with you where the Holy Spirit is invited to move in new ways And in our interaction, hopefully then, something new springs up. Uh, Three more. Oh, three more. Okay. Okay. What has your experience been with the provinces of the Episcopal Church, and how do you see the future of provinces, especially Province 1? Well, I haven't. So I lived in Province 1 for 15 years before we moved to Texas, but I haven't been around here lately, so I don't know exactly what's happening here. The province issue is a tricky one, I have learned, because some provinces are more active and connected and are doing more things together than other provinces. So for some people, the province is just another layer of bureaucracy. That's how they experience it. For people in other places, it's a way to connect. So I was talking to somebody here in this diocese earlier in the week that was talking about education for ministry and about connections with other parts of the diocese. And also, my understanding is that now you're doing your deacon formation program as a uh, province. When I was in province one, we had Title IV training as a province when the new Title IV canons came out. So I think there's a place for it. I think we have to um, very carefully figure out what it's useful for. Because in my experience, we don't need just another layer of things to do or another layer of bureaucracy. So the speed round, what are you reading? Oh, what am I reading? Um, So this morning, last night I was reading Becoming Um, by Michelle Obama. Um, I have been reading The Divine Dance by Richard Rohr. And um, yeah, those are the two latest things. And you have never gotten this question before. Oh. If you could be any cleaning supply, what would you be? (laughs) You win. I have never gotten that question before. Oh, that is... um, so I will so here's the first thing that popped to my mind. So there is a um, there is a little uh, spongy thing that's an eraser for paint. Do you know what 
have you seen those? And I can't remember, it's a Mr. Clean thing yeah, or something. Yeah, it's a white thing. Yeah, the white bar. So I would be that because I don't know how it works. <laughs> but it does work. And ministry is a lot like that, I think. We don't always know why it works, but ultimately if it's working, we don't care. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Janet. <laughs> So I'm pleased to introduce to you now our second candidate of the afternoon, the Reverend Canon Ann Maloney. Melanie. Melanie. You'd think after four days we'd get it right. <laughs> Hello, and congratulations. We were hoping we would see Episcopalians from the Diocese of Maine on this snowy, snowy morning, and here you are. So that's wonderful to see you. Our church is in the midst of seismic change. And I suspect that you have a special understanding of what is happening. Consider and think about, imagine a lobster. In order to grow, a lobster must shed its hard protective shell. During the time of growth, a lobster is vulnerable. It's a time of risk and uncertainty, and it's natural. The lobster cannot grow if it doesn't go through this phase. Our church has shed a lot. Now is a risky time. Now is a vulnerable time, and it feels very uncertain. We are growing into a new way of being the body of Christ in the world, a way of love in the world. It's natural. You have much to offer. I have heard your hopes and dreams. A future of fulfillment and joy await you. And I would like to help develop your gifts to enter into this new life together. For 32 years of ordained ministry, I have made it my job to listen. I have listened all around the world with the church, from the highest levels to the lowest, from Archbishops of Canterbury and Desmond Tutu, to priests and deacons in small, tiny, struggling parishes. With powerful, prosperous parishioners, to the sick and struggling on the margins of society. I've listened in Africa and Asia, Central America, the Caribbean, Mexico, and all across our church. And they have told me of their challenges and of their solutions and strategies. Your profile tells me that you have many of the same challenges and that you have explored some solutions. I would like to be able to come together and let us share our discoveries. The reason I am so optimistic for you and the life that awaits you is that I have seen you in the tiny main parish that in part helped form me as a girl, in the parishes here that have invited me to speak, and most importantly and recently in this whole Bishop Quest process. In this internet age of ours, I would like to help connect you with other people who are also experimenting and doing exciting new ministries. How will we do that? Well, we will join the presiding bishop, Michael Curry, in being the Episcopal branch of the Jesus Movement. We will claim our part in God's plan for redemption in the world, and we will love one another and the world around us. 
This is the life I would like to enter into with you. The spirit is dancing. So just a little bit about me. I'm a Christian and a priest, a wife, a sister. I'm the mother to an Airedale Terrier who wants to be the next canine to the ordinary. <laughs> I am a friend. I'm a native of Kansas, and I have served in four different dioceses and a variety of ministries. I am adaptable. I can hold my own at the table with executives, and I am a pastor to the core. I am at ease in large cities, and what I love most is to be next to the fire with Tony, a cup of tea, a really good book in our home in the woods. I have been me all my life, and I understand, I, I know that it can take time to get to know me, and I have been told it's worth it. I have been, I am, all these things, but you are looking for a bishop. As your bishop, everything that I have done, everything that I have been, everything that I am will come together, along with my lifelong love of Maine, my extraordinary experiences as a priest serving a variety of ministries, pastoring both people and complex systems, and the gifts which I yearn to use for God's glory. I would love to help you, the Diocese of Maine, enter into this new phase of life to which we are all called. This is a future I want to enter into with you. Come, let us dance with the Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. A few questions. In 2018, the General Convention, after much prayer, has affirmed the Episcopal Church's commitment to marriage equality. What opportunities have you taken to personally affirm this historic reform? Yes, I was, I was at convention last summer when this historic vote was taken. I currently serve at the church pension group, and for many, many years we have included spouses, same-sex spouses, uh, in our plan that has been a practice for, for uh, as long as there has been legal marriage, same-sex marriage. And so for us, this has not, um, last summer's resolution did not change our practices. It, it affirmed what we already had been doing. And so that's all very familiar to me. I personally have served with, with clergy who are married, same-sex marriages, and parishioners who have same-sex marriages have served in churches where these marriages have taken place. So for me, this is part of the world in the church that I have known for years, partly because of the diocese where I've served. So it's, um, for me, this is a, an affirmation on a church-wide level of what I have seen to be a rich part of a rich new life that we've had in the church for a number of years. Have you been in a uh, diocese which affirmed, the, the, oh, they all do. So have you, have you personally, I'm sorry, <laughs> have you personally done a, a same-sex union? I have. Classic. I have officiated. Okay, thank yes, you. at a marriage. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yes, thank yes. you. Uh-huh. Thank you. Please, those were my errors of worded language. Um, how do you envision the role of the Episcopal bishop in Maine relating to issues of social justice and political policy? We had many questions that were kind of trying to get at this notion of what the role of the bishop should be out in the in the public square, if you will. Right, which you mentioned in your profile. This was specifically mentioned in the profile. The role of the bishop in the public square, social justice issues, and, and indeed every day of this uh, walkabout process of walkabouts, this has come up. This is important in this diocese, and rightly so, because we all have in common our baptismal covenant where we say that we will respect the dignity of all human beings and that we will work for justice. And we do that best together. We do that well also better with, um, in partnership with others outside of the church, uh, civic leaders, others who have 
leverage in our society. So it's, it's an important thing, and that's why it keeps coming up. In all of my ministries, it has been my understanding that the best test for how well I am doing what I have been called to do and be as a priest is if the people with whom I serve are flourishing in where they are called to serve. And that has certainly been true in this area of social justice. And so, for example, in Hartford, there was a parishioner who discovered that there was a day during the week when there was no meal available for homeless men. There was, there was a meal available for families and women, but not for men. She, this was a burning justice issue for her. And we at the cathedral were able to kind of accommodate this and change Sunday morning around so people together began building sandwiches and simply handing those out on Sunday so that there was food on Sunday for people who otherwise had had nothing on that day. And that has now been, I don't know, 12, 12 years or so. And this program has grown tremendously. But it was out of that passion she had. The Spirit put that on her heart. And I was able to just help provide the resources and organization to be able to help make that happen. And it took off. So that, that is an example of how I've believe that the best test of whether I'm doing what I am to do is whether others are flourishing in what they're called to do. Separate from that, the other part of that question is, as the bishop being a spokesperson, and I would say that there is a role for that, and I would want always that the proclamations, if you will, from the diocesan level must be integrated into the cares and concerns of the diocese and, and at the local level. So I have much to learn about what the concerns are across the diocese, what the issues are, and how that works with what we are doing um, in the diocesan, at the diocesan level. So as a new bishop, top priority for me would be to get to know the diocese, get to know all of you, get to know what your cares and concerns are. Second would be to get to know the elected officials, civic leaders, others with whom we can make a difference in our world. Third would be to learn how to be a bishop. Well, after you've done those things, then perhaps um, the next two questions work, uh, relate to how to work with parishes. The first is, how do you envision your role uh, with the cathedral? And um, how will you support small and struggling parishes who provide many of the social services in the towns, in the small towns that they exist in? Okay. So first question about the cathedral. the cathedral, and second about small parishes and my support of those. So Ben, can we talk? <laughs> so I have been in the role of dean in two cathedrals, and the top priority in both of those was the relationship with the bishop, because if there is a really good relationship between the dean and the bishop, that is good for the entire diocese. So that would be very important to me, and so, so we would talk. And um, for me, also, I, I would, uh, part of, I said I would really look forward to getting to know the diocese. I look forward to getting to know the, the cathedral and what, what it is about, what its role, how it sees itself in the city of Portland, in the Diocese of Maine. So it would be very much a part of my, my sense of role. Besides, we're right there together, side by side. As far as other parishes, again, my commitment to support those who are serving in those areas. Now, I understand some of those parishes are doing dynamic ministry, and they may or may not even have regular clergy involvement. So my commitment to them is, yes, I want to help. I want to have a great community of priests. I want to help develop and, and strengthen the community of deacons and build up the ministry of the laity. So I'm sure you all know that in the Book of Common Prayer, in the Catechism, there's a question, who are the ministers of the church? The answer is the lay people, bishops, priests, and deacons. So I have a commitment to developing laity. And I believe that at this new phase that we're being called into as a church, all of us need to delve into formation. And that would be a priority of mine. Formation of learning how do we talk about our faith in this new day 
How do we share our faith, connect it with our daily lives? How do we articulate what it does, how it informs what we do? And that would be true not just for laity, not just for deacons, but also for those of us who are clergy. The church that ordained me is not the same church that I'm serving right now. The world out of which I was ordained is not the world we're serving in now. So we have to constantly learn how to communicate and articulate and translate what we know, the the God we know, to introduce that God to the world who needs to have that light. Um, Did I miss part of that? I think you got it. Okay. All right. These are good questions, and I'm enjoying them. Um, Given that the average age of parishioners has been steadily increasing without Mm -hmm. an influx of younger members, Mm -hmm. What do you plan to do to create an appealing environment for young people in which they feel welcomed and accepted by the church, specifically young adults and teens? Right. So a couple of quick um, different responses. One, just picking up on another answer that I was giving. I'll, I'll, I'll build on that. But first I'll tell you, I have a niece who is a therapist. She was actually raised in Bangor. She now has a private practice. And her clientele, the people who come to meet with her, are, for the most part, college students and young adults. And I called her and I said, Brennan, could you please just tell me, what are the issues that are coming in your door? What are you helping these young people with? What what are they struggling with? And without missing a beat, she said, loneliness and a real desire for intimacy, and especially intimacy with the divine. And in spite of all their social media, they feel isolated. I thought, wow. I let that sink in. And then I thought, well, what generation doesn't yearn for that? If we get that right, then we will have something important for not just young people, So Tony has a cousin who's a bishop in the Church of England, Bishop of Litchfield, and we were visiting, and I was able to spend the day with Cousin Michael as he went out to visit some of the ministries in his rural diocese, small parishes doing very important social service work in their diocese. And it was a joy, a joy to behold, watch him interact with the people who are involved in these ministries, his role, his interaction with the priests, and... um, I, I was especially taken with one event that we attended, which was a, a, ministry spa, a ministry fair. I think you have something like it in the spring. And there was a parish there that had this big display that they had brought to the ministry fair, and they were very excited to share what they, had, what they were doing. And turns out they were really feeling discouraged because in rural England, like here, population was going away, they were getting older, they just were really wondering what could they do, what was their ministry, and someone came, someone from the parish came and shared with the others and said, you know, today I ran into two or three people who are really lonely, and they they told me they just don't have anywhere to go, and they sit at home, and they wish they had someone to talk to. And they all kind of talked about this, and they said, you know, we have this parish hall. We use it on Sunday for coffee hour, but the rest of the week, it, it's not used. And we all make pots of tea for 11s during the weekday. Why don't we, on Wednesday, just bring all our teapots here, and we'll have tea together, and let's invite people to join us. And this grew week by week because they had hit a nerve. They they had identified a need in their community. And now there may be more people on Wednesday at 11 o'clock enjoying tea, playing cards, doing pastoral care with one another because that's what happens when people get together and know each other. Uh, They learn what the needs are. And um, they are delighted. And they couldn't wait to tell the other parishes what they had found. Their resource was their parish hall and their teapots. And they were making a difference in their town. So... The other part of that is that people come when there is a place, a ministry that's making a difference. It is a magnet for all generations. Um, 
but specifically, I think one of the most important calls that we must hear in this new way of being the body of Christ in the world is to be intentional about what we develop. And so the intentionality or of formation uh, for all of us, learning, delving into scripture, learning what it is to be Christian and how to talk about it, but also leadership development. And one area that I would like to develop is that of the diaconate, because at this point, when we're being called to leave the building, be out in the world, deacons serve at the intersection of the church and the world. So they're going to be helping guide us where do we need to go but also young people, young adults, young people, leadership development would be a priority, too, in all of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, What are your experience with youth ministry, and how do you see youth participating in church leadership? Well, I, I have lots of experience in youth ministry, serving in parishes with vibrant youth ministry and diocese with youth ministry. Youth ministry can mean different things in different dioceses and parishes. So I'm going to just broadly say youth ministry is middle school and high school. Is that a good good definition for youth? All right. So I, I have never myself been the youth minister, but I have been very supportive of much youth ministry. And perhaps the most um, exciting youth ministry that I have helped make happen and support has been in the area of music and outreach through music programs into the communities. There, as you may know, are fewer and fewer arts and music programs in schools. The funding has been cut. The Episcopal Church has an appreciation and a tradition of appreciation for beauty and music, and therefore we can offer to children whose souls, I believe, need these exposure to the arts and music to, um, we, can, we can include them. And it happens in many different ways. In some ways, it's um, community choirs. Uh, one church, by the way, another one of these instances where they were feeling like, what, what can we do? We're shrinking. We, we don't have children in our own church. What are we going to do to get children? Well, someone went out and asked parents, what do you need? And one parent said, you know, all of us work. We can't afford to send our children away to camp all summer, but they need activities. And so this church put together a vacation Bible school. It had a big component of music in it. That's why I thought of it. And and the parents from all over town sent their kids because they trusted the church. They really want to be able to teach their children values, and they trusted the church to help with that. Plus, it was a safe place, and it grew and had a waiting list, so the next year they expanded it to two weeks. And then, so they suddenly realized it's not just, maybe Sunday school model wasn't working anymore, the Sunday school model of the 50s, but they found something that was really important in their town. So that, that's just an example. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, two, two questions. Similar vein, but slightly okay. different. What gifts in particular do you have to offer to the diocese? One. Can you share information about your spiritual life of prayer, an example of being moved by wisdom greater than your own? Oh, oh those are good. Um, and they are connected because I would offer, as a leader of the diocese, someone who is grounded spiritually, who is committed to my spiritual life. And and happy to talk about it so that if there are others who seek some suggestions for uh, apps to use or want to come together in prayer or Bible study, I, I would love that. So, but the other primary gift, maybe um, along coupled with the spiritual grounding, is my experience as a priest in all the different ways that I've had a variety of different kinds of responsibilities and and large organizations so that I bring those executive skills to the diocese uh, along with, with my pastoral heart. And the final part of that was who uh, some instance of being inspired. Yes, I think what uh, an example of being moved by wisdom greater than your own. An example of oh. being moved by wisdom greater yeah. than your own. That's why I love being out in the church. I get to go out and be in the church and listen to people who are moving me because they're all wiser than I am. Um, I just love hearing what the Spirit is doing in people's lives, and I am deeply moved by that and the courage with which people are open to that. 
So, and then I get to spend a lot of time with Michael Curry. Um, I've gone to many of his revivals, and he, I, I can't listen to him without being deeply moved, and he is a very wise man. Great. Um, what has been your experiences with the provinces of the Episcopal Church, and how do you see the future for provident provinces, especially Province 1? Okay, so the Episcopal Church, maybe you all know this, the Episcopal Church has nine provinces, um, and province one is the New England province. I have much experience because of my role with the church pension group. We are out in the church, and I've gone to provincial meetings, and I have met with the bishops of province one um, at least once, I think maybe twice, and then many of them in other settings as well. But as the province one house of bishops, I've met with them a few times with um, church pension group folks. What I have found in province one is a plethora of creativity and honesty and courage and a groundedness in what it is to be Episcopalian. And I can, I could, we don't have time, but I could kind of paint a, a with broad brushstrokes what, what the church is, um, how it is, how it differs from province to province. But this particular province has experienced a decrease in numbers and decrease in full-time clergy, as you all have known. And because there are churches that are very close together, which is not true all over the country, there has been more attention spent on the possibility of combining or having a priest share parishes here than somewhere, for example, where the closest parish might be a two-hour drive away. Right. So a couple quick answer. Yeah. What are you currently reading? Uh, I just finished Becoming by Michelle Obama. <laughs> and, uh, another one? Well, what's next? I haven't got it yet. That's a... I do. I just started one. I can't remember the title of it. <laughs> Can you help me, Tony? Well, there are about six. <laughs> there are. I always have stacks next to me. But... Um, I, I love mystery novels. I devoured Agatha Christie when I was little, and I've continued that genre. And there, at least one of there's at least one of those. I always have like a Harvard Business Review magazine next next to my chair, or related books like that. Um, I love poetry. I've read a lot of Mary Oliver this week. I bet you have. Yeah. And the the final question is: If you could be any cleaning supply, <laughs> what would it be? <laughs> Oh, my. <laughs> Any cleaning supply? Oh. Okay. I would like to be a clean, a clean cloth that I can polish the mirrors and the glass to support the, their important roles of reflecting and letting the light in. Wonderful. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Rachel Tabor Hamilton is our next candidate. Please. Okay. Thank you very much for coming out in the snow to be part of this, and I'm very glad to be part of this exploration and discernment with you. I'm Rachel Tabor Hamilton, and I want to pause so that my husband can introduce himself. Hello, everyone. My name is Nigel Tabor Hamilton. I am the rector of St. Augustine's in the Woods Episcopal Church on the south end of Whitby Island. Uh, and Rachel and I have been uh, uh, on that island for the whole time. And uh, uh, on May 1st of this year, I will be retiring. So I'll be in a loose end. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, May 1st also our 26th wedding anniversary. Yeah, Thank so. You. Thank you. Uh, so I'm glad to have uh, Nigel as such a support. And uh, so I wanted to tell something about myself and my history because it informs how I, what language I use and how I might be answering some of the questions you have for me today. My academic background is in cultural anthropology and folklore studies. And specifically, what I have um, been looking at is how symbol systems evolve and work, specifically, and how symbol systems communicate culture change. All of that has been very helpful to me in my approach to church and organizational change, and recognizing how tradition is actually the adaptive mechanism. Tradition is what helps 
communities through that change. So looking at that, in my work, uh, I've also been a hospital chaplain. In the Episcopal Church, when you uh, become a specialized minister, well, part of that process of board certification involves being endorsed by our office, a bishop suffragan for federal ministries. So that is one of my bishops when I am serving in the capacity of chaplain. And part of that is responding to national and local disasters, whether they're natural or man-made. And so working with organizations or communities in trauma. That's why in a lot of my parochial work, I've been invited into situations where there was substantive issues around organizational trauma or transition. And even when I was working in Maine from 2008 to 2011, I was brought on board to help Maine General create a professional pastoral care department during the time when they had a lot of very different subcultures of Maine, Waterville, Augusta, and outlying clinics come together as one organization. So part of my work was building a professional pastoral care department that had eight staff and 32 volunteers from the community as well as partnerships with clergy around the area. And then working beside management in some of that organizational shift. Because in that work, as I approach it, I approach organizational change and adaptation by looking at what needs to change in the organizational pieces, the policies, the procedures for us as a church, the canon, the governance, and then as well as looking at the emotional system. A lot of what we get tooled with and trained in as professionals is the clergy and laity. We hear about uh, the organizational side, how you do mission, how you do program development, what's the latest thing that we need to do to be able to attract new people, etc., versus the emotional system piece, which I don't think a lot of those models necessarily address but how important it is to make sure that part of our plan in change and transition addresses that piece, to spiritually and emotionally and psychologically prepare the people and walk them through what will be complex processes of bereavement, of uh, letting go of things that they knew, identities that are shifting as a community, et cetera. So an example in my parochial work is when I was uh, working as the rector for a small community in the northern part of the island where we live on Whitby Island. What had happened is after Jean Robinson was consecrated, we had two uh, parishes in our diocese that wanted to separate out from the diocese. And so one of those communities in Oak Harbor, basically the remaining Episcopalians were pushed off property. And they continued to meet in one another's home. And when they called the bishop and said, we want to continue as a community of our own, the bishop was surprised. And there's a whole history for that I can't, don't have time to go into. But what ultimately happened is they asked me if I would come and be their rector, and we retained the language of rector and parish very intentionally. And when that started and we were meeting in homes as a home church, there were 12 people. But the creative nature of that became what was lifted up as the potential and possibility and their new identity. So I have a real affection for small congregations and the challenges that are faced around that. I will tell you that by the time we'd gotten back onto property and done a lot of that identity and emotional systems work and put into place the important organizational pieces, we had 85 members within about a year. So that's not because they suddenly had babies. It's because <laughs> we were able to gradually you know, bring in people, and it was attractive. The new health that was percolating was attractive. So uh, in the work that I was doing here, what I saw when I was looking at your profile as a diocese, there were so many things that I have a lot of passion and experience in that it was something I could not ignore. I would look through your profile and hear how you, there was concern around leadership formation, diaconal formation, lay leadership formation, clergy retooling. And I said, I know that. <laughs> we can do this. And that excited me very, very much. And then I saw elements of recognizing the pressures that are economic and the population 
indicators that show that Maine is really on the kind of front end of losing the boomer population that particularly is indicative of northern Maine. So in the county, the congregations in that area are going to be especially focused, you know, in, impacted by that loss of boomer population. They will not, members of those churches will not necessarily be replaced by younger people. Uh, so it is how does, what does growth look like? What does the model of congregation look like? The model of leadership look like? So as I continue to go through your profile by the end of it, I had so many lights on, I was a Christmas tree. And I, and I said, I'm going to need to respond to this one. Because it was actually when I was in Maine that I first had my bishop back in Washington call me and ask me to, to reflect upon the Episcopacy. And so over that next 10 years, I'm a very careful person, and I have made it my business to do my approach of assessment and organizational assessment of the Episcopal Church in all its functioning. And I've had an opportuni the opportunities to be working with the, the church on both its national and international levels, mostly through my work in indigenous ministries. I belong to, for example, the Anglican Indigenous Network, which is probably one of the best kept secrets in the Episcopal Church that that even exists. Uh, but what it is, is I represent one of two representatives from the Episcopal Church to an international organization of indigenous people from Canada, United States, um, New Zealand, Hawaii, Australia. And we come together and reflect on the commonalities of indigenous Anglicans and Episcopalians and, and our challenges around that. And about a year and a half ago, I was the lead writer for AIN on a communication to the Anglican Consultative Council on the sta status of indigenous Episcopalians in the Anglican Communion. So all of that work also call, you know, calls to me, speaks to me about what kinds of transformation and transition that the entire organization is experiencing and the role of the American Episcopal Church in all of that and how we've challenged it and will likely continue to do so. So all of those things, as I was looking at, I said, this is a role that I know, <laughs> I can know, and I put all these things together. Looking at your profile and being a part of Maine is extremely exciting to me. I think that you will be the Swiss army knife of the church. You'll have multiple tools. We have a large toolkit as it is, and from ethnic ministries, there's even more to draw from that's relevant here. The first question, in 2018, the General Convention, after much prayer, has affirmed the Episcopal Church's commitment to marriage equality. What opportunities have you taken to personally affirm this historic reform? Thank you. When the state of Washington uh, had the opportunity to address this issue of marriage equality as a state, Governor Christine Gregoire was our governor, and she actually created a piece of legislation for marriage equality in Washington and signed it off. But there were enough people who were able to gather signatures that took it to referendum, and it was called R-74. R-74 became this rallying point that finally evoked a conversation in, the par in my parish in Everett that had not happened before. And the reality was I had only been there for a little while when this happened, and I was well aware of it because of my work with the governor and because I was a member of an organization that was an interfaith organization of leaders called Faith Action Network that very intentionally works with our legislators on issues that are important to us as a church for social justice. So I understood this was coming down the pike and what it meant. But I had a parishioner who uh, was lesbian, who was our sexton, who came to me and asked me the question, I have a R74 sign in the back of my car. Can I put it up on the church lawn? So let me tell you some history about this congregation before I tell you more. They basically had at least six couples, committed couples over the long term, that were members of this community and had been for a long time. Uh, one couple dedicated to each other and active members for over 30 years. And others, including the organist. But there never, the whole silent agreement was, as long as they didn't talk about it, it was, everybody was okay. 
And the reason they didn't want to talk about it was they didn't want to be the disruptor in the community with the community that they loved. They didn't want to be that. And the people that they loved said, we don't want to make things awkward. So here's this moment where we have symbolic communication. Can I put a sign in the church's front lawn? And the organizational half of me said, hmm, I'm not sure. But the pastoral emotional system sign said, yes. We as a church, your faith community, are in a position of supporting you to do this and who you are. When she put it in the lawn, it was about two days before Sunday services. Sunday services, my junior warden comes running to me after the 8 o'clock and said, one of our members took the sign and put it in his car and drove away. And I said, great, we're finally ready to have this conversation. And so bringing out the whole education around it led to the following. Eventually, people realized after about a week of conversation and then intentional workshops around these issues that our bishop had created as a forum piece for adult learning, we were able to get to a place of having being the parish, the first parish in our diocese, to have a same-gendered union using the new rights of the church and before Washington had approved marriage equality. So what happened was our new couple were really ready to be the diocesan guinea pigs, and they were that for the education piece for the whole diocese and for the bishop as well. And then finally, when uh, Washington passed it, we had a separate ceremony off in the side altar. But it was a very important moment. Everybody realized the church wasn't going to fall down. And finally, what had been a closeted moment became a celebratory moment. And we've since had about six weddings in Wonderful. our church. Wonderful. Uh, we've had several questions on justice, social justice, economic justice, environmental justice. How do you envision the role of the Episcopal Bishop of Maine in the public square? I think that it is incumbent on leadership to really take the tact that presiding Bishop Curry has taken, which is leadership takes on, in terms of cultural anthropology, a symbolic load. Uh, the, the higher status or perceived status of a leader, the more important it is to do symbolic action on behalf of the whole even if that symbolic action uh, is going to attract a more negative response. Because the higher the symbolic load that people associate with that leader, the stronger the feelings are going to be. So whoever is doing that, and if it's me, I would expect to have evoke strong feelings. But I would also say that our faith is very clear that social justice is something that we vow to in our baptismal covenant when we say that we will work to respect the dignity of every human being. We have to circle that word every and highlight it and say every, <laughs> every body, whether it's somebody that we think is right or not. It's every body in the whole bracket of the Episcopal Church. That means, as a leader, I would want to be doing listening sessions to understand where is the emotional system and do pastoral and spiritual care of all the different pieces of our constituency because they're all worthy of respect and being heard. And then what do we do organizationally? My expectation as a bishop would be any vowed person of the church who has taken the vow to comply with the polity of the Episcopal Church coming out of general convention will do so. And that would be my expectation. And I would also expect to be very careful and intentional and provide educational resources for any social justice statement or action that I would take. Thank you. We have two questions about your uh, working with parishes. I've combined them in the with other people, I'm going to separate them. So kind of shorter answers on, on this. I will do. I will okay. do that. So that's what we're doing. So first, how do you envision the role of our cathedral? I think the cathedral has a high symbolic load as well as, as a congregation because it really does represent how does the church overall, how does the diocese overall do important work like welcoming and how does it welcome the diversity of people? How does it uh, represent outreach into the community? It, it has a, almost that um, uh, 
bigger expectation of modeling for the rest of the diocese those pieces of ministry and work, uh, even around how do they model struggles with finances, because that's something that even the cathedral experiences. And that's a great lead into the <laughs> second with how will you support our smaller and struggling parishes who provide many of the social services in their small towns? Yes, yeah, and that's, he just said it, who provide the social services in the small towns. I think more and more the trending is going to be that, that our churches uh, pick up the slack on those roles as federal and state initiatives continue to be cut. And that's another reason why advocacy is so important. In the meantime, the support of our small congregations is really dear to my heart because those are such an important resource in communities. So it means a lot of uh, need for creativity. Uh, one, there are three points that I would say that I would be working on as a bishop within the diocese, and one of those being uh, leadership formation and development, leadership at every level. It may be that in order to have a sustainable congregation, we need to be developing programs that really do uh, tool and equip lay leadership for more responsibility in administration or pastoral care. It may be that you know, we need to think about creative models from ethnic ministries and elsewhere in our toolkit uh, for how do we train locally our deacons or deacons for specific kinds of parish models. So first it's leadership formation, and then it would be congregational development, because within congregational development, it, it cannot any longer be business as usual. We really do need to be doing this facile kind of embodiment of all this toolkit, which is might be yoked parishes, it could be uh, more clusters, it could be all kinds of things if we have the right kind and level of tooled leadership. And then finally, in addition to, to sort of the congregational and leadership development pieces, I'd be focusing on community development. If the small parishes are really uh, integrated into their local communities and working with partners, whether they're partner nonprofits or all kinds of things that could be possible, um, it's how can we massage those relationships or grow them in a way that enables that viability and sustainability in a broader and more long-term way. It could be that it could include things like letting go of certain assets in order to preserve the presence of the community. Wonderful, thank you. I have three questions now on our, well, a generation younger than we are. Um, are you talking about the big M, the millennials? That, that will be the third <laughs> of the three. So given that the average age of the parishioners have steadily increasing without the influx of younger members, what do you plan to do to create an appealing environment for young people in which they feel welcomed and accepted by the church, specifically young adults and teens? Young adults and teens come out of a generation in our time that really don't have a lot of the same cultural and social baggage that the older generation does. Issues of sexual orientation, issues of uh, racial or ethnic diversity just don't have the same kind of historical baggage for them. And so part of it is working with our um, older members to sort of have those critical conversations and learn how to converse about those things respectfully and in healing ways. Working on issues of reconciliation uh, really comes up. Here we are on the, uh, the, this weekend of MLK weekend and Martin Luther King talking about the beloved community as a community of justice. And so younger people and that's in the generation coming up want to see faith leaders and faith communities doing social justice to right the wrongs that continue to maintain oppressive organizations and uh, oppressive society. And to remember that our uh, vows that we took upon our baptismal covenant are to challenge exactly that. If something isn't right, if our people and our communities are not being served, it, our young people are passionately attracted. And we've experienced that as a parish. If we are speaking in our communities, marching with the marchers, being ready to vest and do that, being ready to show up with the signs and symbols of our church, marching in those LBTQ marches, whatever it is locally that is the presence and the voice of the people, we show up in the marketplace with our symbols that say, we are here and we support you. Thank and you. that's attractive and that's how young people come. What are your experiences with youth ministry and how do you see youth participating in the leadership of the church? Uh, 
Thank you. So three of the ways that I have engaged with youth include we have a church camp, Camp Houston, in our diocese. And so I've made it a point to be active in participating in that as a clergy person. I'm part of the rotation of people that come to those camps or serve as chaplain at those camps in different age groups. So whether it's the real itty-bitties or our teenagers, I'm making sure I'm present and kind of known and around there. So cultivating in those kind of conversations as well as Um, The second thing is having really intentionally uh, identifying consultants who specialize in youth group, whether it is consultants within the diocese or outside of it, to come and do uh, some new, you know, renewed education at all levels of the parish so that people understand what does welcome look like uh, to our young people. And the young people tell us this is what young, you know, this is what it looks like. And a lot of times what they tell us is don't talk about us as the future of the church. We're not your future. (laughs) We're our present. Help us in our present. Thank you. Um, Oh, and the third thing? The the third, (laughs) well, the third, so the the third one, and you've really kind of touched on this, but um, it gets to millennials and Gen Xers, and the specific crux of this question is, is that those cohorts sometimes are antagonistic about the church. I think how can, and maybe a little, yeah, expand on what you were talking about being out with, Uh, out with it. And I think it's because we need to follow their lead. Uh, A lot of times, well intentioned adults uh, in in church sort of say, well, if we do this thing or show up in their forum, you know, that will be cool. (laughs) We'll we'll show them our support. Uh, When in fact, just like any other cognate group, we need to call a circle of them together and ask them. What do you need from us to lead us? Allowing the youth to, to lead us into the model that's meaningful to them. And I think some of the antagonism comes from simply feeling like we continue to use old ways and old expectations about what, what their participation is supposed to look like instead of asking them, how do you want to participate or how can we participate in what you're doing? Uh, and, and just having that dialogue. Uh, one of the things in Native community that we talk about is uh, listening to both the elders and the youth for the direction of the community. Thank you. Um, on a different topic, uh, what gifts in particular do you have to offer to this diocese? Is question one. What gifts in particular? And then uh, can you share uh, an inf- information on your... Sp- can you share information on your spiritual life of prayer and maybe tell us an example of being moved by wisdom greater than your own? So life of prayer, question. wisdom, and gifts particular for the dioceses, diocese. Gifts particular for the diocese. For the diocese. Um, I'm sorry to make you. <laughs> it's okay. I may have to turn to you and ask you for what's the next part you want to hear about. But the uh, the first part. What are the gifts I bring? The gifts that I bring that really uh, resonated with me when I read your profile, as I've been talking to people throughout this walkabout, is that a real awareness of how the church operates and needs to transition and transform as an organization, and how the diocese can plug into that and be part of all of that and do its transition and transformation as well. I understand that where that happens as an organization as a living thing, and how that impacts our understanding of tradition and how we integrate innovative things and do innovative things that are consistent with our tradition. And then I understand and bring a pastoral depth to how to work with colleagues and and my model of um, my vision of community of being in circle with one another. I don't envision the office of bishop as being something that's above anybody. I see it as being beside you all and having conversation and dialogue in meaningful ways before anything happens. If something happens that has to happen suddenly, you'll know why <laughs> it had to happen that way, and we will have talked about it. Uh, the, so all those giftedness. And, and finally, I think it's a gift that I feel a deep love already for me and I, because of the value system and the culture that's already here that I experienced when I lived here before, which was no matter what beliefs people had or where they were on the political spectrum, if there was a trauma that happened, a house burnt down or a snowstorm, neighbors take care of neighbors. And I cannot think of a more Christian value 
to be attracted to. And that's something I believe in. So you asked about my spiritual life. And the life of prayer. My life of prayer is uh, is a daily aspect of intentionality, whether it's through using the prayer book for morning prayer and evening prayer, but also implementing things that are meaningful to me in my native heritage aspect, uh, things that are, are private prayer uh, that are indigenous. And then also... For me, I don't know if you do this, but even when I'm walking throughout the day, when I see something that that feels like God is present there, uh, I'm living out of a sense of gratitude and saying prayers in those moments. What's important to me in my prayer life is also very creation-centered, and so being out in nature and having the accessibility to nature and bringing young people into nature as a, as a breakaway and a getaway to a spiritual space can be very important so that they don't just have sort of what we think about as the traditional space of church, but as the open space of the circle. So all of those things are important to me. Did I get to the third thing you asked? You, you did. You did. And now we're down to all our right. last our last, last two questions, two questions. Which, are, which are kind of speed rounds. Okay, speed rounds. What are you reading? I am right now reading a lot of things that have to do with the ghosts of Maine. <laughs> Oh, come on. That, that, that can't be I, short. No, so. it's been, okay. Uh, no, I, I have a lot of interest right now. I'm actually reading Bishop Curry's book of sermons on love, and he just came out with that. So I'm reading that. I'm also reading uh, things by uh, John Newell, and I'm also reading things uh, by Mary Oliver because of her recent death. And the last question. If you could be any cleaning product, what would it be? I or cleaning would, supply, what would it be? I would be an organically based citrus <laughs> oil because that, uh, that particular product gets out everything and in a very healthy way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very Thank you very much. I want to just uh, first in all honesty say I love snow. <laughs> I really, really do. And I think it's a great, maybe even auspicious thing that the last day of these great days is happening in the midst of what turned out to be not such a great blizzard, uh, but it's still snow nonetheless, and I'm really glad for it. I'm so glad that we're live streaming and we're able to. So a shout out to my family who are watching and friends um, throughout the state of Maine. I want to first introduce my spouse, Tom. We've been together for about 20 years Uh, He's the uh, kindest, smartest man in the whole world and uh, makes me laugh and sometimes makes me cry and keeps me honest and grounds me, and I hope I do the same for him. Some of you know that Tom was hit by a car on December 3rd walking our dog very close to our house, and so we're really glad that he is able to be here and is on the mend. I grew up in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, a very small town called Bruce Crossing, Uh, And I know that the UP is not Maine, and the Maine is not UP, but there are some similarities. There really are. Uh, Five miles east of Bruce Crossing is a little town called Ewan. It was a little fancier than Bruce Crossing. It had the Episcopal Church and the big Lutheran Church and the Catholic Church and the bank and the school. The United Methodist Church was home for me. Uh, It was built in the early 1930s. And uh, it only had about 30 people every Sunday, and it still only has about 30 people every Sunday. But it was a place where I knew I was welcomed, where I had a sense of adults befriending me, where there were people who invited me into leadership at a young age, and it was the place where I first heard God saying through people, you should consider seminary when you go to college. It had four rows of pews on each side, and a Hammond organ, and a piano. And uh, it's still, as I said, alive and well with 30 people on a Sunday. I went down below, as we say, in Michigan. Uh, You say that I'm from away. uh, And in Michigan, people who are not from the UP and go across the Mackinac Bridge say we go down below. I went down below to college and came out uh, fairly quickly and discovered that the United Methodist Church was not going to be welcoming to me. I was invited to the Cathedral Church of Christ the King in Kalamazoo, and it was also a small congregation, but alive and committed to life outside of its cathedral walls. 
The cathedral is no longer there. It's closed. It's been sold to an evangelical church. And the remnant con- congregation now worships in another uh, church uh, sharing space. So I know something about the loss of saying goodbye to a building. I was ordained uh, deacon and priest in that cathedral, uh, having gone to seminary in Berkeley, California. Served a small church in Michigan. In San Francisco's Mission District for a couple of years, learned a lot about uh, urban work, uh, particularly responding to people with addiction and people for whom the church had been a harmful and, and really dangerous place. I, was, I wanted to come to you, uh, actually, especially those of you from St. Luke's. I wanted to be with you in 1998. But Dean Foote called someone else instead, so I had to settle for Vermont instead of Maine. Um, But seriously, I was a finalist to be the curate here. I had uh, nine glorious years at St. Michael's Church in Brattleboro, uh, which is a church not uh, dissimilar from many of yours, a wonderful, thriving town in New England, obviously, uh, that has uh, some great vitality and some great challenges. Uh, I really learned there... uh, Uh, the sense that the more that we could be connected and concerned about people not in our church, the more alive we were inside. The other thing I learned from the folk in Brattleboro was that the more we engaged scripture and the more we spoke about our personal relationship and transformation because of the gospel and because of the person, nature, and work of Jesus Christ, the more we could be truly inclusive of those who have other ideas and also be interested in learning and incorporating as much as possible. I've been a leader in the Episcopal Church since 1994 when I first uh, attended General Convention. I've been a deputy to General Convention since the year 2000. I'm a trustee of the church's pension fund and have been for nine years, and last year was elected to be its chair. So if you elect me to be your bishop, I would bring to you some skills in financial planning and analysis and strategic thinking. And Melanie can vouch for this. I'm the most unlikely chair of that board in the whole world. Uh, I think the reason the trustees elected me to be the chair last year is I think there are two reasons. I think one is that I have been a leader, along with others, in making sure that we are giving honest and direct and loving feedback to the president and the management team and encouraging them and helping them respond to the changing church. I'd like to think that the more important reason why I was elected chair is because I have also been a voice for making sure that we are a praying community of trustees, that we're grounding ourselves in knowing each other, knowing our spiritual stories and trusting each other. I think that's good governance, period. And I think that when we do that, business and decision-making can flow. I am aware that uh, a, a deep attraction toward you has to do with your history and has to do particularly with the leadership of Bishop Knudsen and Bishop Lane. I want to build on their strengths and continue so much of the work that they did and imagine new things that have not yet been done. I think particularly of Bishop Knudsen's work in raising our awareness about addiction and recovery and Bishop Lane's partnership with you in in responding to the 21st century and lowering our anxiety about membership and uh, pushing us uh, towards knowing our neighbors. One of the things that uh, is true about me is that I've been given a gift, and I consider it a gift from God, to dwell in the place of joy and gratitude. People who know me would tell you this about me, And it's not something that I strive for. It's really a gift. But I do try to nourish it with a disciplined prayer life, with with a lively sense that Jesus Christ is, is in front of me and behind me and beside me. You say that you want a bishop who will help you articulate your faith and remain inclusive and welcoming to others. In some ways... Tom and I embody the very kind of welcome that so many of your churches care about. I think that 
bishops and you say, I, well, I sense that you desire a bishop who will connect you beyond um, our churches. So that means to me that getting to know your stories and then together us finding partnerships outside of the church, being a voice for justice in the public square, those are things that I would welcome and have done. I'm currently serving a church that is deeply committed to immigration justice. And uh, there's been occasion for us to, to really return the world to peace. Finally, I want you to know that if you elect me to be your bishop, you will partner with somebody who knows about failure. I can only be who I am. And I'm someone who has made a lot of mistakes. I could spend the day telling you about my failures. And that would mean if you call me to be among you, that I'll be someone who will say, I'm sorry. Uh, and I'll be able to seek your forgiveness and to take responsibility. I think that the parish church still offers something that we can't, we can't access any other place. I think that uh, we can serve in many places. We can give praise and glory to God in many places. We can find friendship in many places. But all of those things together and having a deep sense of the holy inside of us still, for me, are found in parish churches. So if you elect me, I, along with the diocesan, the diocesan staff, would make parish churches the clear and present priority. The late Mary Oliver, our friend who just died a couple of days ago, as you know, she once said, how do you know something is a calling? She said, when you can't help but to go there. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for your prayers for me and for Anne and for Rachel and Janet and for Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Now a few questions. Thanks. In 2018, the General Convention, after much prayer, has affirmed the Episcopal Church's commitment to marriage equality. What opportunities have you taken personally to affirm this historic reform? I want to say how nice it is to have different questions. Uh, uh, it is uh, very refreshing today. I can't wait to talk with the other nominees, but it's really nice to have a new question. And such a soft one at that. <laughs> I would love for you to have a conversation with the Bishop of Vermont. He's a good friend, uh, but I think he would... Uh, agree with uh, my and Tom's story that when we were seeking to have a civil union and to have him be there to bless our civil union in 2003, it was, a, it was not a slam dunk for him. Uh, he has now become one of the great leaders in our church and a great voice of love, and the church has recognized uh, Bishop Ely's tremendous care and leadership. Uh, but one of the things that I've done personally uh, is to push my bishop in 2003 uh, to say, Tom and I are doing this, and we want you. It's important to us when we gather at our Savior Church in Killington and proceed afterwards to our little 10-acre plot of land in Shrewsbury for some strawberry shortcake. It's important for us to have you there. Uh, we've come a long way since then, but there are always opportunities for clergy and lay people to push our bishops uh, to go into the future that God is calling us. Uh, it may not be marriage equality right now, though I am not convinced that there won't be time again when we will need to be reminded of this. It will be something else. Uh, but if you call me to be your bishop around this and several other issues, it has to be about mutual learning. It has to be about uh, giving and receiving feedback and deciding together how are we going to be a voice of justice and mercy outside of the church. A follow-up, because I've asked it to everyone. Have you performed uh, same-gender weddings? I have several of them. We had many questions on justice, on social justice, on economic justice, on environmental justice. Would you talk about the role of our bishop in the public square and how to lead on those issues? On June 22nd, in St. Luke Cathedral, your bishop-elect will stand before the presiding bishop of our church 
and he will ask your bishop-elect, will you defend those who have no helper? And the bishop-elect will say, I will with God's help. If our bishops are not speaking in the public square and not helping us go to the public square, it seems to me we are not being faithful to the tradition in our church, we're not being faithful to scripture, and we're not being faithful to history, including your history. I think the bishop has to do that. I also think that the bishop has to be judicious and the bishop has to uh, be mindful and responsive to counsel, the standing committee, the diocesan council, the uh, parish leaders, the clergy. What, what are the two or three things in the next three years that the church in Maine wants to make sure the entire state of Maine knows about us? And with whom can we collaborate to make it so? This is a deeply important piece of the calling to be a bishop and to bring people together. The next two questions relate to how you as bishop would relate to our parishes. So the first on one side is how do you, what do you envision the role of the cathedral? The largest of I think cathedrals are houses of prayer for all people. And I think your cathedral is it's not uh, unique, but it's one of the few cathedrals in our church that was started as a cathedral. Many of our cathedrals were first parish churches and have become cathedrals later. Yours, uh, not so. And that, I think, is a beautiful piece of your history, which, uh, which lays claim to the possibility of a platform and a sort of embrace of your city, embrace of your diocese, and really an embrace of the whole state. I know that all five of us were deeply moved by our time on Thursday with the dean and with the staff, with the work at St. Elizabeth's, with a sense of uh, pushing the boundaries and holding the tradition at the same time. Uh, the cathedral needs to be a place of radical welcome and, uh, and can be the model for other churches and can also be a partner with other churches uh, who may not have the resources or the platform and the gifts that a cathedral church does. I also think that uh, bishops who tinker in cathedrals uh, are, 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 to be cautious, are to be careful. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, the bishop um, has a role to sort of work out whatever her his desire to still be a parish priest is. Uh, I think that the dean and uh, the chapter, the leadership of the cathedral needs the same level of autonomy that a parish church has and that the bishop is invited to participate in the mission that the cathedral is, is, is providing and responding to God's call. What will you do to support our small and struggling parishes who provide many of the social services in their small towns? I think that the, the second part of that is really key. When you speak so honestly in your profile about uh, the decline and diminishment of many of your churches, uh, there is a great deal of humility there, but there's also another side of that story, which is that in some of your churches, if, they, if the doors of those buildings were not open, uh, there would not be essential provisions for many of the people who live in this state. So my interest would be, especially for churches that are struggling and having a sense of uh, not seeing in front of them a future is to partner with these very churches who are providing essential social services in their communities. My guess is that the churches who are about this work are not as concerned about whether their doors are going to close, that they are already lively sources of ministry and mission. I think what I have heard in the last several days is that it's the churches among you, the parishes among you, who haven't yet figured out a way to be connected to their local communities outside of church that are wanting very much to do this and need help figuring out, listening for God's Spirit. It seems to me that the bishop and the diocesan staff 
have ultimately a responsibility to make sure that local communities get the resources they need to do the mission that God has given them. So one of the ways to respond to this is to partner uh, churches who aren't doing this with those who are. The next three questions will deal with our younger members or potential members. Um, given that the average age of the parishioners have been steadily increasing, without an influx of younger members, what do you plan to do to create an appealing environment for young people in which they can feel welcomed and accepted by the church, specifically young adults and teens? There are two things that come to mind. One is Bishop's Wood and an opportunity for the bishop to uh, be present there. If you elect me to be your bishop, I would want that to be a place where I could also be present. Where the bishop shows up has a lot to do about what, the, what his or her priorities are. The second thing is uh, the, the work that you have long done around youth ministry in your diocese. I know that it is not as robust as it once was, and that's true probably everywhere. But I do think there's opportunity uh, to strengthen that. And if the bishop is present at diocesan youth events, at least initially, while there might be a honeymoon, uh, there may be a chance for the bishop to hear directly from young people who may or may not be engaged in a local church about what their needs are. It seems to me that so often, especially in places where we don't have as many young people as we once did, that's true in the parish that I serve now, uh, we run the risk of suggesting that if we could just get them to come, then everything would be great. I wonder if we might continually to switch that and say, if we could make friends with the teens and young people in in our neighborhoods, in, in our towns, and hear from them about what's, what's their passion, what are they interested in, and then joining them. The presence or absence in church, I'm less concerned about. At the same time, I know that to uh, share the faith is a great desire of yours. I think that's an art, and I don't think it's a science. And I think that things that we did even five or six years ago, at least in the church I serve, they don't necessarily work. Responding to the family who comes every six weeks by, oh my gosh, I'm so glad to see you. I haven't seen you in so long. That doesn't work anymore. People can smell that a mile away. And what they, what they really want to hear from is, I'm so glad to see you. How have you been? And to affirm the possibility that having made pancakes the previous Sunday at home may be just as sacred for them as being in church the following Sunday. So I think for the bishop to listen and to be in relationship with the young adults and the teens who are among us and then find a way to take the message uh, outside and be connected with others. And to extend that age range up a little bit, how does the Episcopal Church share its message with millennials and Gen Xers mm -hmm. who do not only attend services, but are also antagonistic towards the church? I think it's similar. I think that it's about uh, finding ways to be connected outside of the church. But I think uh, the second part of that question, I think it's about being authentic. And I think that when we speak about Jesus in authentic and vulnerable ways and um, say, say what's true for us about times when we haven't had faith or uh, make sure that we're uh, presenting ourselves and speaking in a way that suggests that we don't have all the answers and that we're willing to listen. I, I'm aware that for millennials, and I'm a Gen Xer, that some of uh, the folk in those generations have told us that what they really, really love about some of the things that we do is the deep tradition. And there are churches, uh, maybe not in Maine, but maybe in Maine, where millennials are finding some of the ancient practices that we have long been about deeply resonant. So again, to listen and to ask, uh, I think, is really key. But I think to be vulnerable and authentic 
and to be able to speak about our failures, I think that's deeply, deeply essential and also terribly resonant. Thank you. We have uh, a couple questions, uh, and then we'll go to a speed round. Um, could you share information about your spiritual life of prayer and perhaps give us an example of being moved by wisdom greater than your own? And a second similar question is, what gifts in particular do you have for this diocese? I'm so glad for new questions. <laughs> uh, there were... There were um, there were very few questions in Augusta and Bangor about our spiritual lives. And uh, it seems to me that for all of the skill and resources that I would bring to you as an administrator and a strategic thinker and uh, a voice in the public square, there is also this great need, at least I have need, for bishops in our church to be available and to be truthful about our spirituality. So some of the things that ground me are daily prayer, morning prayer particularly, a relationship with someone who is my confessor and uh, hears me and uh, challenges me about being honest, a relationship with uh, eight other men, a bishop and seven priests, who uh, know everything about my life, and I know everything about their life, and we gather twice a year. And there's a deep commitment to that, to that time of prayer and that time of honesty. Another source of spiritual depth and growth for me is uh, giving praise and glory to God in worship. Whether I'm in the pew or whether I'm leading, I find uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit in those moments uh, to propel me uh, in very many places, both in that moment and beyond it. I, tell me the second part of that question. It was what particular gifts? gifts right. Briefly. Um, so I think my capacity to connect, to be rooted in uh, Scripture, to be transformed by the Eucharist, to have an open heart, uh, to understand that I don't have all the answers and that I would need to listen. I've learned to listen as I've gotten older, and I've learned to, uh, to say when I've failed. Those are, those are particular gifts and joys that I would bring to you if you called me to be your bishop. And now two final questions. What are you reading? The Art of Stillness. Uh, and uh, a book of prayers by Theodore Parker Ferris. Thank you. And our final question, if you could be any cleaning supply, what would it be? <laughs> I would be Mrs. Myers' honeysuckle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What, oh, I guess I've done this 12 times. I should know <laughs> what's expected of me. Um, I, my name is Ken Brannon. I am rector of St. Thomas Episcopal Church in Sun Valley, Idaho. I've been there for 12 years. Um, before that, I was associate rector at Church of St. Barnabas in Irvington, New York, and before that, I was a drama therapist. So I bring all of that with me in my application to be Bishop of Maine. Here in the back row is Rachel Brannon, my wife. I am not kidding when I say she is a very important part of this process. And if you call me, you, she comes as well. But I'm very clear, and she's very clear, not as some second shadow bishop. Um, there's sometimes spouses who don't quite understand boundaries. That's not Rachel. She understands that. Um, but she's just gifted, and she cares, and she's skilled. Um, and I am so grateful that you are here with me for this week and just that you're um, possibly joining me in Maine. So I'm grateful for that. And I hope you'll talk to her and get to know her a little bit. I know there's not much opportunity for that. Um, I have two children. Lucy is 21. And she is at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. And she finishes up this year and is 
in a time of transition about next steps. She may go to grad school. And Isaac is 17. He's a senior in high school. Um, and he's kind of keeping tabs on us and, and taking care of the house while we're gone. I just want to get a sense from you. Have you been watching the videos that are online, reading the statements, watching some of the walkabouts? Okay. You will hear some of it again. And you're going to be patient um, and, and say, I've heard that before, but maybe in a new way. But also, we're finding as we go from room to room, actually some things are changing and evolving. And that's really cool because it means that certain things are coming forward as priority. We thought we knew what we wanted to say, and some other things are coming forward. So bear with us as we do that. What, some of the key things you need to know about me to know what formed me and what shaped me. Um, one is where I grew up, which was Mandeville, Louisiana. My dad and mom are from the East Coast, my mom from New England, my dad from West Virginia, um, but in, as part of his studies, he became a cancer researcher and taught at Tulane University in Louisiana, and so I lived in Mandeville, which was a small town at the time, it's become quite booming now, but it was a small town, and we were part of a small church called Mandeville Union Protestant Church. That was a center of our family's life for my first 12 years of my life. You know that some people, some children, can't stand being in church and can't wait to get out. I was one who not only loved to be in church, but loved to sing hymns, loved to hang out with the pastor um, when I had free time after school. Call came very early for me to the ministry and to church. But then I spent a lot of my adult life thinking that that was childish and that I was called to other things, and here I am, I'm back. Um, and what I can tell you is those early calls that children have, that early sense of what am I meant to do, take those seriously. Because sometimes God or the universe or however you want to describe it is working on young children, and that was the case for me. From Mandeville, Louisiana, I went to South India. My dad took a job in Saudi Arabia. And so for four years, I was at a boarding school called Cody Canal International School, and I was immersed in an international setting different faiths, different cultures. Um, I think that probably had more to do with who I am today than almost anything, and a sense of not being afraid of difference, not being afraid of new situations. Um, I've got some folks in Sun Valley who are like, aren't you scared of going to a new state and a new people? And I'm like, well, it's always uncomfortable, but every time I've done that, I've experienced blessing. Um, so I'm one who is able to kind of cross lines and cross cultures and feel okay about that. Um, I did attend Wheaton College um, for my undergraduate degree and studied psychology. And I don't know if you've heard of Wheaton, but nowadays it's not in the news for the right things. It's in the news for um, not being culturally sensitive to Muslims. It's in the news for kind of a closed... Um, to me, it's very sad because when I was at Wheaton, and Rachel actually was there as well, it was a generous Christianity, and that has shifted. Um, and so... While I had a great education and I love the college, I'm concerned about the direction it's taking. From there, I went to Washington, D.C., and I lived in intentional Christian community with homeless men. Can you imagine how that shapes you for two years to live and eat um, and work with those not only homeless men, but the doctors and social workers and nurses who are caring for them? So that exposed me to the city, to the real problems that are in the world, and asked me to think, how do I respond faithfully out of my faith to that, those situations? From Washington, I went to New York. I went to New York University and became a drama therapist. And I did that for seven years before I was ordained. So that is critical because I learned about the importance of healthy systems, about how groups can connect with one another and experience healing through play. Um, these are things that have bearing on church and on dioceses. Because the question is, um, are our circles safe in our parishes, in our conventions? And then once there's safety, is there permission to play? Because that's actually how you become who you're meant to be when that creative spirit is there, when you can make mistakes, um, when you can kind of be real. And one of the things this discernment committee and transition committee has done beautifully is they've created a space where we can really be ourselves. The chaplain of the group pulled me aside after the first walkabout. I thought I was in trouble. And uh, she, she called me. She can. I was like, oh, my goodness. And she, she called me over and she said, you were fully yourself just as I hoped you would be. And that is, you know, kind of what we want to create in this experience. And I think they've done a great job of doing that. 
Um, and then anyway, just I went to Virginia Theological Seminary, was trained there, associate rector in Irvington, New York, for four years with children, youth, and families, and then on to Idaho, where I've been rector of St. Thomas now for 12 years. So I share that story with you to know that this has been quite a journey. This is not my first time around the block. Um, I have been in situations in the parish that have been joyful and difficult. I have been tested. And I think you want to call a bishop who has been through the tough times as well as the beautiful times, because as bishop, that's going to happen. There are going to be times of conflict, times of misunderstanding, um, times of outright attack. And to have experienced that and come through the other side by the grace of God, that is a gift I bring to you. Um, and, And maybe I'll just stop there. Thank you, Ken. We have a few questions, as you might, uh, you might think. Uh, the first one, in 2018, the General Convention, after much prayer, has affirmed the Episcopal Church's commitment to marriage equality. What opportunities have you taken to personally affirm this historic reform? Good. Great question. Um, and that question's being asked a lot in a lot of the rooms, and that tells me it's a priority. You really want to hear people talk about this with integrity. Um, so... My, my action, my experience in this is I was at General Convention when these resolutions came up. I voted in the affirmative for them. That's interesting because not everyone goes to General Convention, but when you stand up and vote for something, it's putting yourself on the line. Um, and I did that happily, um, partly because of how I've been um, taught and tutored along the way by my uh, gay and lesbian friends. In St. Thomas, we have a church that is very diverse around not only politics, but also social issues. We are not of one mind. So when General Convention took these actions, I knew there would be not, it's not like in the South where some of my friends literally got run out of church. It was scary for some of my friends in the South. But I knew there would be discomfort and confusion and um, some need to talk about it. So one of my theories, thanks to a mentor, I I studied under Frank Wade. If you know Frank Wade from St. Albans, D.C., He was an amazing mentor. He said, if you ever sense heat in the parish conflict, steer into it. Don't avoid it. Steer into it. Not in an aggressive way, not in a combative way, but there's a gift there. It means that people care. And so I came back and I steered into that heat. Um, And we did a listening session, partly just to make sure people are well-educated, talking about the issues involved in homosexuality, looking at scripture, and understanding that it's not monolithic in its witness about homosexual behavior, Um, making sure that those who disagree could really say it wholeheartedly and feel like they still had a space at the table. Um, I get very worried when we have a litmus test um, that you have to think this way, and if not, you know, we don't do it, but it's almost like you're not a full member. It was very important that people could speak their conscience and really feel... Um, like they were part of the community and sitting at the table. We did that series. Um, It was then time to go to the vestry, and the vestry made a decision to permit same-sex marriages, and I had agreed that I would perform same-sex marriages if I was approached. Um, I have performed two marriages um, for for two couples, um, and it's simply been life-giving. The amount of joy and the amount of life in that sanctuary when we did the same-sex marriage was the best witness to the Episcopal Church in the town. People came to this who didn't even know about church because they were so impressed that we were willing to step out and take this position. Um, So that's where I stand. And at the same time, I understand that there are people of good faith who don't agree, and they need to know that they are welcome at the table. We've had many questions about justice, about social justice, about economic justice, about environmental justice. How do you envision the role of the Episcopal Bishop of Maine in the public square? Mm. So the core of justice is right relationship. If you look at Hebrew scripture, the very basis of justice is right relationship. So I think, actually, the bishop has a big part to play. Are the relationships within the diocese just? Um, Are the, you know, whether it be with the dean of the cathedral, whether it be with the deacons in the parish, whether it be with vestry wardens, is there right relationship? And if people see that, 
they will feel as though there is justice, as it were, in the diocese. So just remember that justice isn't just carrying a sign and fighting for something. Justice is first and foremost right relationship. And the reason we have to fight for justice is relationships become skewed. They become um, based on things other than love. So that's the core of justice. The bishop has a role to play in representing the diocese. But it is not... It is the diocese that helps the bishop understand when it's time to stand up. In, at St. Thomas, I do not jump out on the street corner with a sign every time something happens because I would be dismissed. I would become invisible in my overactivity on justice issues. When I decide to stand up, often with the counsel of my vestry or with other trusted people, the impact is profound because people know that I don't just jump up for everything. That is something you might want to consider is when is it prudent to take action and what kind of action is effective. Just to be passionate and just to be loud is not necessarily the right way for the world to hear you. So I think there's some wisdom and some nuance in how to stand up for justice and to make sure that you're consulting widely and that it represents the people. I'll give you one quick example. With the issue uh, in terms of the church and how they would deal with same-sex marriages, if I had jumped out front and been the point person on that, it would have been less effective than the way I did it, which was there were advocates. There were people who were passionate about it. It was their spiritual gift, if you will. They were able to lead the conversation. And what I did is I walked with them and often sometimes several steps back so that the parish could do it together. Sometimes I think clergy people misunderstand and they get out ahead and they're no longer ensuring that their parish is with them and that's when you get division and alienation. And so you want a bishop who's um, wise and sensitive around these things. And I would consult with the standing committee um, and other trusted leaders to know when is it time to amplify something and when is it time to wait. The next two questions relate to the role of the bishop working with parishes. So I'll split them up so... Just two kind of. Uh, the first is how do you envision the role of the cathedral and the bishop's role with the cathedral? The bishop's role with the cathedral? And the role of the cathedral. Okay. Um, Rachel and I, when we first moved to New York City, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine was our spiritual home for about four years before we went to Trinity Wall Street. I have lived in that setting, I have gone to. Um, formation classes in the cathedral. And what I know is everyone assumes the cathedral is rich. Everyone assumes it's full of people and powerful. And in fact, what is often happening is the cathedral is trying to be many things for many people, and it bears a burden. It's a gift, but it's a burden. And sometimes people don't realize the strains and the stresses that are on the cathedral and on the staff. So I think the key for the diocese to understand is the cathedral has a particular function, but it's not intended to be all things for all people. And so, you know, for the cathedral staff and the dean to think about what is our call in relation to the diocese, those conversations need to happen, but they will not happen if the bishop and the dean are not getting along and are not respecting each other and assuming that, you know, collaboration is going to yield a better fruit. So I have seen situations where the bishop and the dean don't get along, and it is an energy sap, it, and it is a, it's a disservice to the diocese because that's what we're focused about. So what I can tell you is you need to call a bishop who sees the dean as a partner in ministry. In this situation, it's kind of remarkable. You know, cathedral has oversight of part of the building. Bishop has oversight of the chapel and the Loring House. Uh, that's fascinating to kind of see and understand. But I think any ways that we can symbolically link the ministry of the diocese and the ministry of the cathedral is key. And I would also say we do, I think the cathedral, and I'm assuming it has done this, but I don't know, that there's some really good strategic visioning happening that makes it clear what you are called to do and what is someone else's to do so that you're not overextended and you're not spent um, because you want to be sustainable for the long term. Um, and it's, it's easy for cathedral and their staffs to um, become burned out because they're actually trying to be too many things for too many people and, and care for that core. Whatever that core group is that's praying, they are having a, an immense impact on the diocese as a whole. So nur nurture and care for that spiritual core at the cathedral. Now, the other side of the coin, 
what would you do to support our small and struggling parishes who provide many of the social services in their small communities? So, yeah, this is interesting because the small parishes in many ways are the vanguard. They are the ones on the front lines responding to the needs of the people in the towns. And part of being bishop is coming and actually listening. A lot of these questions have been, what is your plan for or what's your program? I have no idea until I come and I spend time in the parishes and listen and really find out what, I don't want to assume. I don't want to assume I know what is happening in the small parish because which small parish, in what setting? Um, There are things that are kind of common, but I think your bishop has to visit, has to have presence. I talked about this in another um, session. The ministry of presence, there's a couple ministries, but the ministry of presence is one of the greatest gifts the bishop can give to the small churches, to show up, to listen, to ask. Um, And the diocese doesn't have unlimited funds and income. I think sometimes there's a magical thinking that the diocese has a whole bunch of money um, and they're just not giving it, they're just not sharing it, and that's often not the case. So the question becomes, how do we allocate resources? And then how do we call lay people into their God-given ministries so that there is a sense of vitality and growth and energy, um, because in a sense, the local community is responsible for fostering spiritual gifts so that the church is alive. Um, sometimes in a time of lack or anxiety, we turn inward. We, we shut down. We become rigid. And the question, maybe the bishop can help with this, is to keep turning people outward to see that in losing our life, we gain it. In attending to the stranger, we are blessed. Those kinds of things I know are not normal language in Maine and in New England because often it's, you know, it can be a little bit, you know, who's away and who's in. But I will tell you that if parishes can gently turn to the needs of the neighbor, um, there's life in that. The next three questions relate to our younger... Is that your water? Can I use it? Uh, uh, May I? Sure. Sorry. Um, relate to younger members or potential members. So uh, given that the average age of parishioners has been steadily increasing, without an influx of younger members, what do you plan to do to create an appealing environment for young people in which they feel welcomed and accepted by the church, specifically young adults and teens? Mm -hmm. There's another question that's going to do with Gen X and a little bit older. Okay. So part of what you need to understand is much of my ministry is with children, youth, and families. And so I have done a lot of work. I understand the curricula that are available for Sunday school and youth group. Um, so I, have, I come with some background on this. The question is a little bit dangerous because it's how can we appeal? How can we be relevant? In my experience, and this is actually because I have two children who are 17 and 21, they actually aren't looking for the church to be relevant or appeal to them as much as they're wanting it to be full of integrity and full of, um, and genuinely welcome them. You know, not kind of as a prop, hey, look at all these children we have. This is a sign of how successful we are. Or these children are going to make sure that we don't die as a parish, right? That's using children for inappropriate purposes. But if you love them, and you welcome them, and you treat them like they have something to offer, they will come. They can sense it. They can tell when you treat them with respect. Um, And so I think that's part of the question. You know, sometimes in churches, there's this uh, graspy feeling like, oh, my God, a child. We're so glad you're here. And the child's like, whoa. Um, Or for a teenager or a young adult as well take a breath before you tackle the person and, you know, encourage them to do 20 things. Just introduce yourself, welcome them, um, and, and those things can build over time. But it's also hard. I mean, I, I, I want to acknowledge, demographically in Maine, it is an aging population. Children and youth, or youth and young adults, are moving out for job opportunities. So this is a unique demographic issue. So I don't think there should be a fantasy uh, um, about how many young people are going to be in the church, but I, I think we have to begin with honoring them for who they are and trusting them that they have something to offer. And it might not look like what we want them to offer. You know, they may not be reading the prayer book, but they may have something to tell you about justice because the young people I know are pretty passionate about the earth and they're pretty passionate about social issues. And we better be ready to hear them and to follow them when they lead us. 
Well, that's perfect because it, ex- it goes right to how can the Episcopal Church share its message with millennials and Gen Xers who are antagonistic to church? I don't know if that's true. Um, they are antagonistic to expressions of church that are not worthy. They are not antagonistic to the sacraments. They are not antagonistic to faithful preaching, in my experience. Uh, in fact, um, and I know you said Gen Xers and Millennials, but my confirmation class, which is teenagers, they are leaning in and they have questions and they know that they're going to be heard. So I think we make some assumptions about Millennials and Gen Xers. They are done with the institution and ways that the institution has been unfaithful. Now, the only thing that younger adults don't understand is institution is not a bad word. Institution is simply what is able to carry the gifts of the people over time. So I am not one who believes in shredding institutions, and I know there are some young people who want to do that. What happens then is that the, the inheritance that we've been given spiritually, it's hard to sustain over time without an institution. What I would say is the institution needs to be trustworthy and it needs to be faithful. I have never found a millennial or a Gen Xer who has rejected um, good institution. Can you and, sh- and I'm sorry, and there's one other piece of that. And they need to be educated as well. I mean, they don't know what they don't know. And so formation and a way of helping them understand what ancient Christianity is and what this practice, this way of love, you know, it is costly and it requires commitment. And so I think young adults would be hungry to have something of value and purpose to lean into. Um, uh, that's, the, that's the young people I know. Yet another great segue to share, tell us about your, your spiritual life of prayer. And maybe uh, specifically reflect upon an example of being moved by wisdom that's greater than your own. Okay. I am so glad you asked that question. We were talking last night as the nominees, and we were surprised that there weren't more questions about the spiritual practice of the nominees, not because it's some kind of competition who prays the longest. If your bishop is not praying, you're in trouble. And so all of us were able to talk in our dinner last night about practices of prayer that are life-giving. So I want to reassure you um, that your nominees, the ones that were at my table, have a practice of prayer. For me, um, there's a couple ways. Um, I have a book, a little black book called Hour by Hour, and it's based on pulling from the prayer book, but in kind of a bite-sized way for morning, noon, evening, and before bed. And that clock, as you were, that, that spiritual clock uh, orients me throughout the day. Um, and it comes just when I need it. You know, when I'm most busy at the church and I'm worried about something, if I stop at noontime and say that prayer, it puts everything in perspective. And I think as human beings, we need, I mean, there's a reason monasteries do it the way they do it. We need a calendar, a clock, as it were, um, to take us out of our impulses, to take us out of our anxieties. Um, So I try to use that as often as possible. I don't get to it four times a day all the time, but that's an important part of my prayer. I've also found lately, um, I have a shoulder injury, which is going to get worked on next week, um, and that's made it difficult for me to sleep in the middle of the night. Uh, The pain wakes me up sometimes. And I have found that that really quiet time in the early morning, I don't even get out of bed sometimes, and I'll just lie there and I will be in a practice of prayer and kind of invite God into the calendar of that day. So whether there's a funeral or whatever it is, um, just kind of walking through the day and, and asking the Holy Spirit um, to be with me in those hours of the day. Um, so that's a new time of prayer that I kind of wasn't expecting, but um, I decided rather than being frustrated, I would use it in a, in a good way. Um, does that spiritual practice, is there? And then, uh, you know, I love corporate. Here's the thing. If you are introverted, you have a particular way of praying. If you are extroverted, you have a different way of praying. And sometimes we impose introverted models on extroverts, and they can't figure out why they hate praying, because actually you're not matching a style of prayer with your natural um, inclination. So I would invite you to think about that. What are introverted ways of prayer? What are extroverted ways? And they're actually valid. Um, And don't assume there's just one way to pray. So we're beginning to come to the close. We've got one more longer question and a couple for speed round. How much time do we have exactly? Who knows? 
Thank you. Okay. And that sounded like five questions, and that sounds like two minutes. Okay. You can do it in two minutes. What gifts in particular do you have to offer to the diocese? Mm. When I was young, one of the gifts I prayed for, and I don't know why, was wisdom. I prayed regularly for wisdom. And I don't think that's normal for a child. <laughs> but I wonder if it's because God had already given me the gift of wisdom and made me aware of it. And so I do find sometimes in complicated situations when it would be easy to make a black or white decision that there is often much more complexity and nuance in a situation. And I'm able to hold that um, ambiguity and not feel like I have to react. So I believe I have the gift of wisdom. I also believe I have the gift of encouragement. Um, and th in some ways, this is easy because we do spiritual gifts assessment at St. Th uh, Thomas, and I've taken the, the inventory. Um, and one of my gifts is encouragement. And so when someone is discouraged or hopeless or feeling tired, I can offer a word that encourages. Um, and I think leadership, um, I think that comes pretty naturally to me. Um, this isn't exactly a spiritual gift, but Rachel would remind me that I am playful um, in the appropriate times, but I really enjoy a spirit of play, and I don't mind cracking up the room. I mean, it's not being the class clown, but I sometimes can sense in a room where the pressure is, and I can relieve it with a word. And that is unique. Um, and sometimes can be incredibly healing in a situation that's intense or kind of scary. Um, so those are a few of them. Again, another good segue. Great. <laughs> what are you reading? Um, I am reading Gregory Boyle's book, um, Tattoos on the Heart and Barking to the Choir. If you haven't read this, it is life-changing. Um, it's a Catholic priest um, who created Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, oh. and he basically shares the words of the gang members who are reforming their lives and they're so deeply spiritual and so emotionally true it's and our final question yes if you could be any cleaning supply what would it be and why oh that's easy um, i would be windex because clarity uh, one of the things about me is i actually kind of say what i mean and i mean what i say i'm not um clouded and so windex it kind of gets that glass clear and you can see through it that's who i am wonderful thank you <laughs> thank you for concludes our time together thank you be safe be home safely in this storm